I'd just like to thank Carl for the invite here and EMS as well. Um, I've never been to South Australia before, so this is the first time for me. I have heard about your Port Jackson sharks, so um, it's a bit of an honour to be here to talk about them. Um, like Carl said, I'm from Jervis Bay. I've been diving in Jervis Bay now for 20 years. Um, I'm basically, I'm just a scuba diver. I got passionate about the marine environment from the very moment I put my face in the water. And because I was diving in Jervis Bay all the time and seeing the same things all the time, I found after a couple of years I did need something to help keep that interest going. And when we were approached through our local dive club from a researcher who was doing his PhD work on Port Jacksons, I of course stuck up my hand and said, yeah, I'll help. And little did I know that that would lead me to here 20 years later. So, um, so basically scuba diving, I'm a professional scuba diver now, I teach and I also run my own dive business called Crest Diving in Jervis Bay. I've been involved in different documentaries. Um, back when Shark Gordon was doing his uh, children's series on sharks, he came and they came and filmed the Port Jacksons. The BBC have done a shark series. It's not that good, really. The Port Jackson <laughs> segment, that is. The rest of it is. But there is one good part, piece in the Port Jackson, Jackson segment there. Um, the Japan Underwater Film Company came and did a documentary as well on the Port Jacksons in Jervis Bay, and theirs was absolutely incredible. Um, hopefully one day we'll get, it will come out in Australia and everyone will be able to see it. At the moment it's only being filmed in Japan and a few other places like apparently Estonia. I'm famous in Estonia for it. <laughs> um, Blue Bottle Films, they're a local film company in New South Wales and they come and they've done My Saltwater Sanctuary, The Sea and Me. When I leave here I'm going to a private screening of a new film they've done called The Map to Paradise, if anyone's heard of that. It's been um, broad, or promoted around as well. And uh, lots of media publications, newspaper articles, all sorts, radio, everybody. As soon as you say shark, everyone wants to know about them. So I'm more than happy to tell you what I know about Port Jackson sharks. But just bear in mind, I'm not a marine biologist. I'm just an underwater naturalist. And I, nowadays, because I do lots of surveys and that, I'm also called a citizen scientist. So it's all really exciting. Um, Taronga Zoo was the last one we did, that's where this shirt comes from, where we got together with schools and did field days. We even got to bring the Port Jacksons out of the water. We had them in little pools on the, on the beach so that the kids could come and learn about the Port Jackson sharks as well and that was a huge success. So that ran for a couple of years. At the moment I'm um, a bit of a founder, we're trying to get the Jervis Bay Marine Discovery and Research Centre incorporated up and running. We're in our first, first initial stages of that as well. Um, with the research, Port Jackson sharks, Wobbegong sharks, shovel nose sharks, fiddler rays, turtles, weedies, scallops, all those different universities. Um, and yeah, you name it, if somebody wants help with something, then I'll go out and help them if I know where to find it. I should add sponges on that now to look at Psycon sponges as well. So anything really. PJs have just become my specialty. Um, so Port Jackson sharks, I'm sure you've all seen a Port Jackson shark, have you? You're all interested in them. You know what they look like and their main features. These ones here, these are all these are adults on these pictures. Um, did we want the? Is, can everyone see that? Okay, it's not too glary. And that, the light. That one. Okay. So on the uh, left hand side, that one's a male shark. So you can see he's got the. I've got a pointer here. He's got claspers that come out, and that's the easiest way to tell the difference between male and female sharks. Um, and that includes rays as well. All male sharks have claspers. In this picture here is um, pointer. This one here is the female. They tend to be a lot larger uh, than, the, than the males. The males are really small and slender. This is the top of this, that's the male there. The females, they get a larger head. For the, and they also had, get a larger body as well to accommodate all those egg, egg, egg capsules that they produce. They produce about 16 uh, eggs per year, per season that they lay. Uh, but unfortunately not all of them are viable eggs. So the juveniles, that little fellow, I actually saw that one last week. Um, and, oh sorry, can we go back? 
There we go. So in, in this egg capsule, every year, usually from about December, January, I start watching a juvenile grow inside the egg. Um, it's about January when they start to develop. And the earliest time I've ever seen a juvenile or an embryo developing inside an egg, uh, it was late December one year. And as the juveniles in the eggs develop, the eggs themselves will start opening up on the top. And that, and that allows the water movement to go through for the embryos. Uh, late December one year, I was looking for a, a particular egg that I could start looking and watching that embryo with. And I only ever choose one egg per year, just in case I'm causing some sort of hassle for that shark and may be detrimental to its health. I don't want to go doing it to every egg that's on the reef, so I choose one egg to watch each time. And hopefully um, one year I might get to actually see it hatch. Uh, but this, this particular uh, egg that I found, it had only started partially opening and I kind of helped it the rest of the way to open. And when I did, what I saw inside was the yolk sac, because they contain the yolk sac, which takes up most of the egg space inside. And the yolk was covered in veins and it was beating like a heartbeat. And it was so cool. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And at that particular moment as well, at that time of the season, is when we get the crested horn sharks also come back in on the reefs. You don't get crested horn sharks here, but I'll show you what they look like shortly. Um, and I believe that the beating yolk will, is, will help the predator to find the embryo uh, because the, the Port Jackson eggs are highly predated on by crested horn sharks, Port Jacksons themselves and other species as well. I can't definitively tell you which species until I see them eat them, but they do get predated quite a lot. And in Jervis Bay, our, the whole bay is basically a nursery area for juveniles. You just need to know where to find them. It's usually in the middle of the bay, around about 11 to 20 metres down in the middle on the silty, sandy part of the bay and near areas of seagrass. So they use seagrass areas to camouflage with their pattern markings and the sand areas for feeding. And we find that when you approach them in there in the seagrass, they will swing quickly to deeper water to get away from you as well. So, but they're very cute. Determining the sex of a juvenile can only be seen by basically picking it up and having a look because if it's a male, their claspers are too small to just visually see. Inside the eggs, you can determine their sex because as they develop inside the egg, they, they turn. And it, it takes about nine, 10 months for the eggs to develop until they, or for the embry embryos to develop till it's hatched. And they turn as, as they go. And eventually, if you watch at the right time, you'll, it'll turn around and you'll be able to see whether it's got claspers or not. So the last one that I watched was a male and he was called Lewis. I'll tell you about him a little, actually, I'll tell you now. Um, little Lewis, I watched him for a long time and then I took a, a, a young lad snorkelling with me, young autistic lad, and I went down and I got my egg that I've been watching and the embryo was quite developed by then and I brought the egg up and that's not something I normally do when I'm snorkelling, I usually only show divers that. So, but I brought this egg up for Lewis to have a look at and he spent quite a lot of time watching this egg. So the egg was still underwater, but it was open and he spent a long time looking at the egg until eventually we thought, we were starting to get worried it was too long. Went down, put the egg back exactly where I got it from. And then each time after that, I, when I went and looked at the egg, I was really concerned that I'd killed the shark doing that because it just hadn't changed position inside the egg. And it had been several weeks after that and I was that concerned that when one of the researchers that I've dealt with over the past, he was, came to Jervis Bay for a bit of R&R &R, and we went out there one night for a night dive and decided that that was the night that if this shark was still in the same position, I'd bring the egg back and we'd check it out and see. So anyway, got the egg, showed the other divers, little Lewis was still in the same position, that's what we called the shark, little Lewis was still in the same position. so. After showing all the divers, I made sure they all saw me put it in my pocket so they could remind me that I had it in there. And when we got back up the top and took our gear off and laid it down, and 
I had actually hadn't thought any further about what I was going to do with this baby shark if it was dead or if it was alive or what we were going to do. So young Nathan Bass and I, we were having discussing that and in the corner of my eye, I just see this movement near my dive gear. <laughs> and I thought, oh, it's a lizard. That's exactly what I thought. And then I didn't pay much, too much attention to it. And then I heard this flap, flap, flap sort of sound. And I look over and there's little baby Lewis shark. He'd hatched out of the egg, out of my pocket and was flopping around on the concrete path. So you've never seen anyone grab up a little shark so quickly and go running back to the ocean to set it free. So, and he did eventually swim, and swim off. So it took a while, a bit of encouragement. He kept coming back to me. So hopefully, I wished I'd taken a photo of him. I didn't even think of that. So hopefully he'll, he'll survive and come back to Dent Rock and I'll meet him again one day. So Dent Rock's the dive site that I've been doing a lot of research at and that's the main dive site. And it's, it's a great dive site because it's basically, it's just a pile of ballast rock that was dumped from wool ships. Lots of crevices, surrounded by seagrass, got kelpy areas, sandy areas, five to seven metres maximum depth there. And you can actually do the whole site in one dive as well. So you can cover and survey the whole site. So the surveys I used to do back then were as simple as this. Um, these were the sheets that the original researcher, David Powder, provided and the information that he wanted to know. So, you know, your basic information, your dive site, who you are, date, visibility, temperature, water temperature, 17 degrees for this one in September. Um, we so kind of discovered 17 degrees seems to be a bit of a magic temperature for Port Jackson's. In Jervis Bay, as our water cools down, once it reaches 17 degrees and is there for, quite a, for a while, that's when you start seeing the sharks come in. And when the sharks come in, it, it, we found that it's the males that come in first. Uh, whether they're doing a territorial thing, that's what we believe at the moment, and we're still having strong feelings about that. Um, and then it's a good month before you start seeing females. Um, so on this day in September, we saw 49 males, 39 females, and there was one unknown because it was just too, too far under a rock, I'd, I'd imagine. Um, there were a lot of eggs. Um, we were collecting eggs back at that stage as well because Dave, when, with his research, he was looking at the biology and the ecology of the sharks, so the whole life history of them, which made it really fascinating. He wanted to know about other large fish, injuries on sharks, um, and just any other details that, that we could tell him. I used to tell him everything. Um, we were tagging sharks back then and as you can see there was a whole list of, ta list of tags that uh, we recited on this particular dive. See, back then I didn't even know, do they turn in the shell before hatching? Yes. Okay, these are the tags that we used to use back then. So the one on the left, they're the visual cattle tags and there's actually a tag on each side of the dorsal fin. We used to punch a hole in the, in the shark's fin with a leather punch and then we had a, another punch that used to do the two types of tags, a bit like getting an earring put in your ear. Um, and the juveniles, we used to measure and tag them. They got those tiny little tags, a bit like a clothing tag that you get. Um, so we did that for quite a while, the tagging. And then when Dave's research finished, one of the things that really concerned us even when the tagging first started, we were seeing some results of what the tags actually did to sharks. I mean, this poor shark, it, the only way I describe this is it looks like their fins are rotting away. They're really detrimental to the sharks, unfortunately. Um, they, the one up the top there, they get a lot of growth on them, sponges, barnacles, and it grows in between the tag and the fin. So they're really, really horrible. Um, the tags themselves, you can't read after a while. You do have to catch the shark, scrape the tags off just to read the number. And this photo down the bottom is not great, but that particular tag had fallen down onto the back of the shark. So as it moved, it was digging <coughs> holes into the back of the shark. So that, that was actually quite distressing to see all of this happening. Uh, this is a play video. So, one of the things that I did when Dave's research finished, because nobody else was doing anything with tags, I started removing them. 
So I just can't believe that they get left. So this was on a night dive one night and had some divers with me and every winter I carry side cutters with me so that I can cut tags off and I've been doing that for like 15 years and in all that time I've only managed to get off 24 tags out of about 80 odd sharks that were tagged at Dent Rock. And you just have to put up with the, any bad quality of the video as well. So she was very feisty, she, rang, she wrestled me a lot. I tend to find the ones that have been handled by people and researchers and that, they are more skittish of us um, and they tend to swim away, whereas the ones that haven't been handled, they just sit there most of the time. So that was me looking at someone saying, come on, who's gonna come and hold the shark for me? <laughs> yeah, see, see, I was telling, yeah, yeah, come on, come over. Um, this particular tagging ceased in 2005. There are still different types of tagging programs happening out there. Fortunately, not using these tags anymore. I will, yeah, yeah. But I have a solution as well. I'm, I'm really not happy with tagging at all, any of it, so. But it does get quite political. So I try not to say too much. But there's a solution to it. It's an easy solution. It's just not easy for the people that are researching. I believe I saw one earlier this year, but it swam off so fast that there was no chance at all that I was going to be able to even follow it to even see if it was. But I expect there should be because there were hundreds tagged from New South Wales, Sydney and Jervis Bay um, in total. I've never seen one that wasn't tagged in Jervis Bay except for one that came up from Queenscliff once and it swam from Queenscliff in two weeks. Um, when I found it, sorry? How far away is that? Uh, Queenscliff's in Victoria, so yeah, quite a while. We do know from research that the uh, Port Jacksons migrate down, at least the females migrate down as far as Tasmania and that. The males, we don't know where they go yet. Um, we're hoping the new tagging stuff be with the acoustic arrays that are all around the place now um, that will show that. I tend to think that the males just go off the continental shelf in the deeper water and that would be why that they come in earlier than the females as well. So we've been doing more research. When Dave's research stopped, I'd been surveying for three years these sharks and going out with him and being his research assistant and do, helping tag and do all this stuff. And then one day I went out there and I saw my first Port Jackson shark for the season and I looked at it and just thought, what do I do now? I'd been surveying for three years. I didn't know what to do with this shark anymore. And so I just kept surveying. I kept following the same survey things and just logging it. I log every dive in my dive log. So that's where my surveys went into my dive log. And I figured one day some other researcher is going to come along and hopefully get benefit from my information. So when they did, uh, the Macquarie University had some researchers doing PhD. And the difference with the research that Dave did and these guys were doing was that everything we did with the sharks 
We did underwater on scuba with the sharks where we found it. These guys were bringing the sharks, that's me by the way, carrying the sharks. But these guys were bringing the sharks out of the water. They were being put in troughs, um, surgically implanting the acoustic tags. So the sharks were being anaesthetised in the water, tags being implanted. Um, Nathan, when he started his research, he did contact me and we talked in great length about the different type of tagging methods and that. So he was really keen to not have tags affect the sharks as well. So one of the tags he came up with was a pit tag, which is basically like microchipping your cat or your dog, which seems okay, except now, six years later, there's all hundreds and hundreds of sharks out there with these pit tags on them, but nobody's reading them. So what point is there for them? So I did ask the uni to give me an underwater reader one day and I'd go around and you know zap all the sharks and read their numbers for them and stuff. Um, but the very first time I went under, it got flooded because they didn't set it up for me properly. Um, and they never got me another one. So, you know, um, so it's, it's a pointless tag. So if, if sharks are going to be tagged, they should have a meaning for the tag because there's no protocols in place to remove tags. Unless the tag is designed to detach itself from, from the animal, and it's any marine animal, um, they don't have protocols to remove them and they should. I've shown you the damage that happens. So Nathan finished his research and there is more research happening now and that and they make me really cranky, the new ones. Um, but sharks also suffer other injuries, it's not just from tax. So you've got fishing pressures. You guys know better than anybody else about the fishing injuries and that, that you get on the sharks. I can't even believe what I've been reading. Um, this is the sort of fishing injury we get at home where the fisherman's hook's caught in the mouth and they'll cut the mouth open to retrieve the hook. Um, this one here, the jaw of the shark was broken. It looked like it would have been like completely twisted around and there was all this algae growth growing inside the shark's mouth because it couldn't close its mouth properly. Um, other than that, it actually still looked pretty healthy. And the sharks that I've seen with half mouths like that they heal up pretty quick and even though they're missing part of their mouth, they still look pretty healthy and they still get around and, and uh, do what they're supposed to do. So I hope they don't have too much trouble feeding, but this guy here I don't have too much hope for. I don't think he'll last too long, but we'll see next year if he comes back. They also get parasites, <coughs> leeches, like all other sharks and stuff. And one of the things over the years we've seen, the little eastern cleaner clean fish we've got here, quite commonly we find them cleaning the sharks. Um, the striped fish louse that's on the clasper of the other shark, and it's quite common to find fish louse on the shark's claspers. They're getting a good blood supply there um, during the mating season. And whenever possible, they'll actually pull them off, because I think the poor shark. I don't know how many other people have actually been bitten by a fish louse, a fish louse in their lives, but yeah, I have. <laughs> it hurts. It stings. Um, one of the things I noticed back with Dave's research, when we were had to write down any injuries or markings and things like that that we saw <laughs> on the sharks, one of the things I was noticing was what I call a red dot. That red dot. Not the pointer red dot, but that one there. <laughs> and it was always in front of the second dorsal spine in and only on female sharks. So to me, because I was seeing it so often, it has to mean something, doesn't it? It's only on females, always in that spot, and so it has to mean something. I presumed back then that it, it probably meant the shark had just laid an egg. I had a... Um, during a survey that we did with some of the local dive club members, one of the members came back saying he had seen a shark lay an egg. And it's such a rare thing to see. And the way he described the shark laying the egg, he said the shark swam up to the crevice and lifted its tail right up on a 90 degree angle and then the egg came out. And to me, that kind of made sense as to why you'd get this mark in front of the second dorsal spine if it folds up like that. I've since changed my mind about that, by the way. Um, some of the older sharks, in front of the second dorsal spine, they have really old white scar marks and that, not just the red dot, but lots of scarring around that area too. 
So something I've been watching all these years, something that the researchers haven't really cared about at all, um, but I think it's a significant thing that needs to be found out what it, what's causing it. So mating, this brings me to mating. Um, in the left-hand photo, you've got a, a female there and she's being mated with by one shark and she's got another three males, they're all interested in her. That's really common to see, um, more than one shark trying to have a go. Um, I've seen sharks, this, this female here, she's got a little egg poking out the back. Oh, sorry. She has a little egg poking out there. You can only just barely make out the dark shadow. But when they're, when they're getting ready to lay an egg, um, the egg will be poking out a little bit. And it can poke out for hours. And they can also pull it, push it back in or pull it back in as well. I've even seen male sharks trying to mate with a female shark with an egg poking out. So I just like, not sure how that works, but the next time I see them mating, I'm just going to have to take a before and after photo <laughs> and see what happens. So this female, she's an old, she's an old female that's been visiting Dent Rock for as long as I've been going there. And the same with this male shark. This particular male shark He's almost like a pet shark to me. He's always on the same part of the reef when I get there. And he's always there early in the season. And he's there pretty much every time I go to Dent Rock. So he definitely shows site fidelity um, and probably shows a lot of uh, uh, territorial behaviour as well. And he's easy to recognise from his deformed fin. This one is another video. This was the first ever video of egg laying in the world. This was many years ago, back in 2004, I took this one. Um, with that particular egg, three dives after that, each dive I went back and I made sure that I could see where that egg was. I knew exactly what hole it was laid in and that. The very next dive, it was actually in the hole next to it. And then the next couple of dives, it was still there, it was still there. And then unfortunately, we've got a mooring chain that, that's used to mark the isolated danger marker for Dent Rock. And the mooring chain this year has been wrapping around the rocks and just, just tearing it apart. So I can't even, I don't even know where that egg's gone anymore. I don't even recognise that part of the reef. So there goes that one. So I just have to go back to my old hole that I look at eggs in, which is this one here. There's usually about five, six eggs. Uh, by November there's about five or six eggs in the bottom of that hole and they get wedged in the sides underneath and I'll choose one out of that hole that I look at each time. On the other photo, it was just, it just looked really cool, there was all these eggs lined up on the bottom. But over the season, with all those eggs being laid, very few actually get secured into the rocks. Most of them get predated on by other Port Jacksons, I think I already said that, and the crested horn sharks. So you'll swim around, you'll see a lot of whole eggs rolling around, there'll be a, like a bit of a gutter and it will be full of eggs. You can get there and just chuck them all up and it's raining eggs on you. Um, they're all non-viable eggs and amongst them you've got the crushed ones, so when they were crushed in the middle, that's usually predated by another Port Jackson or in our case crested horn shark as well. So it's very easy to tell that. Port Jackson shark with an egg in its mouth, um, predating on the egg. And that's our crested horn sharks. For those who don't know the difference between the two, when you first see them, um, you probably think a crested horn shark is a Port Jackson shark. We get that all the time back home. And especially in summertime when someone goes, oh, I saw a Port Jackson, I'll go, was it? And then I'll start questioning them about it. And nine times out of 10, it turns out it's actually a crested horn shark they've seen. And if you're lucky enough to come to New South Wales and see a crested horn shark, the main difference is that a Port Jackson's pattern forms a triangle on the side. A crested horn shark's doesn't. So that's the easiest way to tell. The crested horn sharks um, crest above their eyes. They come up and then abruptly go back down quite sharply, whereas the Port Jackson's just a, a smooth across. Um, also, they're a little bit shorter, a bit stouter. They've got the blotchy pattern. Their mouths are usually pink as well. Um, yeah, and they're usually solitary rather than in great numbers like we get with the PJs. 
Uh, this photo, okay. So, because of the tagging, because the visual ID tags are being taken away, I've been taking them off and um, they're not using visual ID tags now as well. None that I can see and tell the difference between sharks. So I've been trying to work out how can I, how can I know, unless it's a shark that's got a distinctive feature, like this shark here, he's got, that, uh, he's got these, the first top notch of his tail's gone. Um, this, that particular shark's also one of the ones with half his mouth missing, so I'd say that's the fisherman's done that to his tail too. But I first thought, okay, the side pattern, there's got to be something in the pattern of the shark. They're doing it on manta rays, they're doing it on whale sharks, uh, weedy sea dragons, quite a lot of marine critters they're using photo IDs for. So why not the Port Jacksons too? Sure, there's hundreds out there and thousands even. Um, but they do show site fidelity, so I should be able to I should be able to learn about more about the ones at, at Dent Rock and recognise them without tags. So I started off taking photos of the side of them, but that was actually quite difficult to do, especially the sharks that swim away when we approach now. So I thought there's got to be another way, and I started looking, and so then I started taking a photo of the top of the head, and that's a, not something that we normally look at as divers. Um, everybody looks at the, the front and the sides and that. So when I started looking at the tops of the heads, oh. I started noticing they have really, really different pattern markings. This one here is that female that laid the edge, this is a dorsal fin. And then that uh, other shark, I did believe she's a female. So she's, her pattern's completely different. And there's another example mm -hmm. as well. And yet another example. It's so variable. <coughs> and another one. And so I'm actually quite getting sick of taking headshots of Port Jackson's. I've got thousands <laughs> on my camera already. And I only started at the end of last year's season. So I've done one full season of every dive I've done, every Port Jackson I've seen that I can, taking headshots of them. I'm getting to know them already at Dent Rock and the other sites that I regularly visit, I'm recognising these sharks. With that mooring chain at Dent Rock that I mentioned earlier, uh, smashing the reef apart, aside from the researchers causing disturbance of the sharks on the local reefs, um, this mooring chain has caused a real disturbance of the sharks for their breeding season. I, last time I swam around there when they should have been like 50 sharks there, I counted three and I'm like, where are all my sharks? And so I went for a, a snorkel over to a nearby reef, a Ryan Reef, and that's actually the reef that the researchers are using at the moment, um, just to see what's going on out there. And all the Dent Rock sharks were sitting at the edge of a Ryan Reef, and I'm pretty sure that was because of the mooring chain has been smashing around the rocks, but they were all sitting there all together in a great big huge aggregation, all the males, females, and I recognise them all from the patterns of their heads for the photos I've been taking. And I figure the researchers do all that stuff for at least three years before they do anything with those photos and patterns, so I can keep doing it until then. Fiddler rays are another one that I'm taking photo, head mm. photos of. You guys have fiddler rays here too, and they're being hammered by fishermen just as much as the PJs. So um, back home, uh, I know the researcher that's doing the fiddler rays as well, um, so one of the things I'm encouraging them to do is, is to do use the photo ID patterns. The fiddle rays in particular, one of their distinct markings is just up here. They have a series of dots and dashes right there across their nose and they seem to be different each one, as well as the patterns themselves. So, so I'm trying to encourage visual ID of all these sharks and that. And that's it, that's the end of the slide. I hope. I just hope I didn't forget anything that over the years that I've learnt, but if you've got any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. We don't know everything yet, I'm still learning. Maybe in 20 more years I might be able to tell you some more. Do the spirals on the edge chains all have the same orientation? I believe so. Yeah. It's not different in the Northern Hemisphere. No, they don't get them in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, you, 
Do you know if they're using machine learning to identify photographs with whale sharks and things, and that maybe be used for these? Because these yeah. there's so much machine learning. I, absolutely, they would be able to. I've got I downloaded a program, and it's a free download from the internet um, for pattern markings, um, and I've had a little bit of a play with that so far where you can pick points of reference and I'm actually pick, picking points from the snout to the eye ridges back to um, and back to the dorsal spine and so we're picking those points and that's what's being compared and it's just a matter of getting time to put the data in pick the points on each individual photo and then let the, let the program do its job you should be able to just automatically put the dots there in the photographs and just go, that's Fred, that's Martha, that's Jane. Yeah, you're talking to someone who's not into computers. I'm into going out there and actually looking at and swimming yeah. with them. There so is, There is an organisation, organization, I think they're calling it a program, Whale Book or something Okay, like I haven't heard of that one yet. So I'm doing research yeah. on Southern Rights Book. Okay, yeah. Pattern recognition, and so we're working with them to see if we can... Oh, excellent. Tap, but they're doing whale sharks. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, back home we know the weedy sea dragons. The so, researchers are taking photos and using their spots to identify individuals. But that's an organisation you could potentially get in touch with. Yeah. I'm just hoping some researcher is going to come around and want to do some relevant <laughs> research. And yeah, I've had a lot of my data analysed by different researchers. They need a, a project for a thesis or whatever it is. You know, I'm more than happy to share my information with them and they can help us understand them even better. You know, and that goes with any marine animal that's in Jervis Bay. So, because I'm there all the time. Alternative tagging, hopefully. Absolutely, I hope so. Um, the acoustic tagging, there's different methods that they're doing that. They're doing the surgical impl 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 implanting of them. Um, and it's just not in Port Jackson's. It's a, it's a whole variety of different species with the arrays the government's got up and down the coast and all that for the acoustic tracking. Um, I have problems with that because those tags are internally placed. We really don't know what's going to happen and they only last like five years or so before the batteries run out. Um, sorry? How long did the At least 30 years was what Dave's research showed. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen to these tags once the batteries run out. Maybe they're just going to sit there be dormant. Maybe the sharks will expel them out of their body somehow. Um, maybe they'll start rotting the sharks from the inside out. We just don't know. Um, some acoustic tags are being done externally. I know they're doing that on the, on the uh, bull rays at the moment at home uh, with external acoustic tags. Um, I'm keen to see them because I believe those tags will, will attract growth on them, so they'll get all the big long strings of growth and things like that. Um, I'm hoping she'll take those tags off when she's finished. She should be able to. Um, but yeah, I just think they should do protocols. They shouldn't be attaching tags to externally, especially on the dorsal fins in the great whites and stuff. Um, you can't tell government agencies. They're just going to, you know, you're going to wake up to a million emails if you do. Trust me, I've been there, done that. Um, so, yeah, all we can do is just hope to encourage people to speak up and then perhaps they'll look at different methods of doing things. And that's how we learn anyway. Back when Dave was doing his tagging, he was made to use those tags. He didn't want to use those tags, but he was made to use them because that's what they were using on the grey nurse. And they're now currently banned. So, yeah, we're progressing. <laughs> Any other questions? Anyone want to come see a baby in summer? Yes. <laughs> so, but yeah, in winter I take people out and we, sh we show them the aggregations and that. Um, and in summer when the when the adults aren't there, I go and show them little babies. So, you're welcome.